Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. Okay. And so it's sort of a <coughs> easy process. You just follow the instructions that are contained therein, and then what do you do with them? Uh, we bag them, confiscate them. And then give them to the investigator, place them in evidence? We put them in property, and then um, the investigator decide whether to send it off to you relative to GSR testing when are you generally called upon to administer <coughs> those tests? Um, typically whenever you have somebody that's suspected of shooting a firearm it gets a little tricky in the testing process if that firearm, if you're in a room when a, where a firearm has been um, where the shot has occurred then you can have that in the room Besides, it doesn't work real well. Um, There's more of a, for somebody's, I mean, you think it's fire weapon, and they're not in the room where the weapon's been fired. The physical kits, I'm talking about the kit itself, mm -hmm. that you as an evidence tech utilize to administer these GSR tests, test, excuse me, mm -hmm. where are they kept? prior to their utilization? Um, we usually keep them in a file cabinet in our unit. And would it be fair to say that the Knoxville Police Department has plenty of those kits certainly available to test folks if the need arose or a request was tendered by an investigator? Um, I can't speak consistently throughout history, but for the most part they are, but sometimes we run low we get more. So okay. All right. On or about December 17th, 2015, December 18th, 2015, you don't recall running short of GSR kits, do you? I don't recall. Nothing further. Thank you, sir. Give us your name, please. 
I'm Officer Vanessa Mays with the Hospital Police Department. Can you spell your first name, please? Yes, ma'am. It's V A N E S S A. And your last name? Mays, M A Y E S. How long have you been employed with the Knoxville Police Department? Since 2012, about five years. And what do you do with the Knoxville Police Department? I'm on patrol on night shift, the east side. And back uh, on December 18th, December 17th, 18th, 2015, when you saw him before? Yes, ma'am. I uh, recall the events of that evening. I do. Uh, you could, uh, before we talk about the incident on the 18th, do you recall hearing a call about shots fired on December 17, 2015? Yes, ma'am. And uh, when you heard that call, where were you at? I was working up in North Knoxville, off of Broadway. Now, let's go to December 18, 2015. Uh, you said you worked night shift. What hours would that be? Uh, 10 at night till 8 a.m. Tell us about uh, getting a call for service on December 18, 2015. The... Green Hills. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, I was working up north. The call did not come to me. It came, I came to assist um, the units that are in the short east area, which is off Natchez. And the call came in that there was a male, or there was a vehicle that had driven into a building, a residential building. It was an apartment building, and that, that there were shots fired in the area as well. So, so what, did you <coughs> what did you do when you got the call? Um, you heard the call, I should say. I wouldn't, I headed that way because I knew it would be a, a chaotic scene. So. What did you observe from your rock? As soon as I got there, they were putting up crime scene tape. There was a vehicle into the building, and there was a large crowd gathering at the area. So, what happened? You got um, I walked up to one of the officers that was by the caution tape, and I just remember hearing somebody screaming and yelling um, asking to, to, he was just screaming and yelling at that point. So. Um, what happened after that? Um, a gentleman walked up to me and he was, he asked me to get his phone, which was, his phone battery, which was in the vehicle, he said it was in the vehicle. Um, and at that point, I told him, no, you know, no one can go past the crime scene tape. I can't either. So we can't get the phone battery for you. And you recall Investigator Leffler being present? Yes. Now, um, after you told him that you couldn't go past the crime scene uh, tape, what happened? Um, he walked away. Um, he seemed to calm down for a second, but then he started screaming and yelling again. What happened after that? Um, and an older woman came. I believe it was Brady's grandmother, I believe. Um, but she said, she was saying, <coughs> you know, she's really upset. She was saying, you know, my daughter just got shot. Is that my grandbaby? Is that my grandbaby in the vehicle? And I, at that point, I didn't know. I didn't know who was who. So, I was just trying to calm her down, and she just kept saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, just, I guess, with all the, the violence that had been going on. She was really overwhelmed with that. Now, eventually, at some point in time, the individual that was talking about his uh, phone battery being in the car, did you take him into custody? I did. Um, when Detective Luffler got there, the male was saying, I just, I need my phone battery, I need my phone battery. He's like, were you in the car? And he said, yeah, I was in the car. He said, why is he not in the back of the cruiser right now? And at that point, I took Mr. Bassett into my cruiser. Now, your encounter with uh, Mr. Bassett, as well as uh, Mr. Perry's grandmother, with it, was that captured on your in-car video? Yes, sir. We would like to uh, play uh, the portion um, of her arriving up to the portion that Mr. Bassett is taking with us. I have an objection, ma'am. And John, that's going to be that's four seven. What is that?
Yeah, I've got that. that is 471. All right, do you rec directing your attention to the wall, do you recognize this scene? Yes, ma'am. Is this the scene? And what, is this the scene from your in-car video? Yes.
Anybody else is walking to the police department to be interviewed? Um, yes, there's one person in Officer Nelson Hamilton's car that I followed him to the police department. Okay. So. And so when that when you got to the police department, mm -hmm. you got Officer Nelson Hamilton in front of you. Yes, ma'am. What happens when y'all get to the police department? Officer Hamilton took his the person who was in charge of upstairs, and then he came back downstairs and. Helped me get Chris and, and uh, for the record, do you recognize uh, Mr. Bassett as being the individual that you encountered that night? Yes, sir. And if you could tell us what does he have on today? A uh, blue suit and a red blue tie. The record could reflect what's identified with him. That's what Mr. Robert, do you have any questions? The general played you a video that's part of the in-car video of your vehicle, correct? Yes. And it's fair to say that not only were you there that night, because that was your car that arrived at the scene, correct? Yes. But that you have subsequently had an opportunity to review this video on now at least two occasions. Yes. Actually physically in court occasions, right? Mm -hmm. One time, yes sir. Okay, prior to today? Yes, sir. You remember me being uh, there and having an opportunity to ask you questions, right? Yes, sir. All right. And relative to your interaction with Mr. Bassett, the gentleman that you've identified over here in the blue coat, it's fair to say that he was upset? Yes, sir. Okay. You could tell that uh, 
he'd just been involved or watched a traumatic event. Yes. And you identified his voice on the video along with the voice of a woman, correct? Correct. The two people that you were asked to identify. Yes. Other than Investigator Leffler, and I'm talking about just in this portion of the video. I get there are other voices in other portions of the video. Do we hear identifiable other voices on that video? Like other officers? Is that what you're uh, other individuals, other officers. Yes. Okay. What other officers do we hear? Officer John Stevens. Yes. Um, I believe Officer Mark Taylor. Okay. And that's all I remember. And then the two, if you will, citizens that we hear are Mr. Bassett and this lady that you've identified as the grandmother of the individual that was in the car, correct? Yes. And I apologize, what was Officer Mark's last name? Taylor. Okay, thank you. Now, the discussions that we heard are Man, uh, that's my bro. I'm going to be the one to talk to you, right? Language to that effect? I got one. I think we can clarify as to who said that. Yeah, that's did not say that. I got you. She just. Yana, can we approach? <laughs> Officer Mays, now that uh, the general has mentioned that to you, you recall I asked you. Do you recall me asking you two voices identified on the video? Yes. All right, and you told me two voices. You told me Mr. Bassett, and you told me a lady that was subsequently identified as a grandmother, right? I think so. Right, I asked you about two citizens, and those were the only two names that you told me. Right. Okay. Then I ask you about the statement, I'm going to be the one to talk to you. We had this recess that we just had. Do you know whose voice that was? Um, no, I don't know my name. No. But now it's your testimony that that's not Mr. Bassett. No, it's not Mr. Bassett. Okay. And relative uh, to the actual interaction with Mr. Bassett when investigator Leffler first asks him were you in the car language to that effect mm -hmm. he answers affirmatively yes correct yes and then when investigator Leffler suggests that he's going to be placed in a car that's when the reversal happens correct as far as what he says, it says, oh, I wasn't in the car, right? Where Mr. Bassett backtracks Yes, Yes, I mean, he, took, he takes backwater once he realizes he's going to go down to the jailhouse, yes. right? And it's fair to say that you then, at Investigator Leffler's direction, placed him in your police vehicle, correct? Yes. And albeit he wasn't handcuffed, when you are placed in the confines of the back seat of a Knoxville Police Department vehicle, a cruiser such as yours, you can't open the doors from the inside. I'm going to object to being a compound question. That, that's fine. Are you familiar with the type of vehicles that the Knoxville Police Department operates as patrol cruisers? Yes. Were you exceedingly familiar with the cruiser that you were operating on the day in question? Yes. Being familiar with that, can you open the back doors from the inside? No. Okay. So, when Mr. Bassett was placed in the police cruiser, he was, at that point in time, confined, was he not? Yes. 
Okay, he couldn't get out. I mean, absent slipping through some crack or something, he was there, and you escorted him to the Knoxville Police Department, and you indicated that you followed another officer there, correct? And that other officer had another individual that was confined within the back area of his car, correct? Correct. And you then sat there with Mr. Bassett for a while and had a dialogue with him, didn't you? I did. And he actually talked to you about the fact that he had just seen his cousin shot and that there was blood spurting out of his neck, didn't he? He did. Visibly upset, he'd just seen a man die in front of his very eyes, hadn't he? He didn't know he was dead. Okay. He saw a traumatic incident. That, by anybody's interpretation, would be considered to be a serious injury. I'd say so. Okay. Then the other officer that you indicated escorted the other, was it another African-American male that was taken upstairs to the police department? It was. He came down and then took Mr. Bassett and escorted him upstairs? Um, he came down with me. We right. You, you both did. Yes. All right. And that's officer safety issue, right? I can add just one second here. When you got there, there was a large crowd out in the Green Hills area? Yes, sir. Okay. Nothing further. Thank you, ma'am. Officer Mays, did you see Kipling Colbert that night? I don't remember. You don't remember? No. Would you have noted it if you would have saw him? Um, yeah, if I, if I knew who he was. Okay. I don't, I don't know people by name, you know. Okay. So how many um, African American men did you see that night? Quite a few. We were in Green Hills. Okay. That's all I have. No, sir. No, Thank you. Thank you, Officer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You saw me swear or affirm the testimony about the of the case now on trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth itself. So have we got? I'm going to have a seat. That's good. I'll give the jury your name, please, sir. Spell your last name. My name is AJ Leffler, and it's spelled L O E F F as in Frank L E R. And by whom are you employed and what capacity? I work for the Knoxville Police Department as a bond counsel investigator. How long have you been so employed? With the Knoxville Police Department, 24 years. And as a violent crime investigator, how long? For 20 of those years. Were you so employed back on uh, December 17, 2015 and afterwards? Yes, sir. Okay. I'll ask you if uh, that was a normal investigative day in your line of work. It started off normal until we got the first shooting on Dallas, and then from there, it really escalated to a, a quite a violent day. Tell us about receiving that first call. Um, basically, answering the radio that, that, uh, that they called for violent crimes. I answered it. They told us there was a shooting uh, on Dallas Street, and me, along with my two other partners at that time, uh, went to Dallas Street. Let me ask you this, uh, were you aware at that time of any uh, reported shooting in Western Heights that had occurred before you got that call? No, no sir, we, uh, I wasn't, uh, our unit was not. We usually just get notified when there is a victim. If it's a drive-by or a shooting in an area and there's no victim, we don't normally get uh, notified of those things. So do you recall then about what time it was you got that call to go to Dallas and what you did after you got the call? 
runs. It was just after the seven o'clock hour, and I jumped in my car and I, I drove it. When you got there, do you recall who all was there at the time? As far as law enforcement, emergency personnel? Yes, when I get there, there was already law enforcement there, uh, our, our patrol officers. There was uh, CAFD and for other first responders there. What did you do then when you first got there? When I first got to get there, I tried to find an officer that knows something about what's going on, try to get an update, uh, and then I go into the scene to see what's, you know, what we can figure out. And was that uh, officer then Lieutenant Taylor at that point? At, at, that, at that scene, yes. That's what it was. So after was. Um, talking with him, did you go into the house? I did. And did you discover a victim? I, yes. The victim was being treated by KFD at that time. Uh, she had a gunshot wound to her hip and backside area, and she was laying on the floor in the hallway. And we've seen pictures of that. Was that where she was when you got there? Yes, sir. Were there other uh, potential witnesses to what had happened there that you made contact with? Yes, there was a Macavia. I might be mispronouncing her name. Miss Billingsley. She was a ten-year-old little girl that lived there and was the daughter of Mrs. Perry. And were they the only two individuals that were potential victims that, that you discovered? From, from at that time, that's all I understood to be in the house. So what did you do then after you uh, made contact with uh, those people? Well, uh, of course, I talked to uh, Ms. Billingsley, the, the 10-year-old little girl, to find out what, what happened and uh, why the house was being shot up. And I guess uh, you since at least heard her 911 call that reported the 911. That, what happened? Right. And was that what the story you were getting as well? Well, they, a little bit more in depth uh, about what they were doing prior to the shooting, who was there prior to the shooting, who had left, and then what happened during the shooting. And who, what information then did you get as to who was there prior to the shooting? Uh, prior to the shooting, uh, I was told, or I learned, it's the same. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I learned that uh, Brandon what, Perry. Right? Yeah, it, I guess, yeah, it's, it's your side. Yeah, you can't, you can't that's fine. Uh, the were at, at that point did you examine the house for uh, 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 gunshot damage or anything such at that point in time? Yes. Uh, the house is a corner house where it's uh, uh, that on Dallas and. Uh, not Mason, it is Mansion Street. And basically, it appears that they came up Mansion Street, started shooting on that side, and then turned on Dallas into front of the house, continued to shoot, and as they passed the house, they shot back towards into the house. Okay. So it was actually on three sides of the house, it, it, uh, bullets actually hit. Now, while all this was going on, were there, were there other individuals that were gathering there at that scene? While other people were coming up, showing up? And, and I was inside the house, and my intention, of course, was to miss Terry and Ms. Billingsley. Uh, at some point, I did notice someone else who was in the scene, uh, named Brandon Perry, came to the scene, and I, I spoke to him. Where were you when you spoke to him, as best you recall? Uh, in the, I was in the house, I, I believe in the dining room, kitchen area, right outside the hall where the paramedics and the KFP were working on this pair. When, uh, what, were, was he inside the crime scene, so to speak? Uh, he was inside the house, so yes. Was it already taped off, or as far as the yellow tape you recall? I don't recall. Uh, of course, my attention, once I get to the scene, is to speak to witnesses and victims. And what, uh, tell us about your encounter with Mr. Perry. Can you describe his demeanor when you first had Brandon contact Perry? with him? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, of course, he, he, he appeared to be upset that, and concerned about what happened to his mother and that his mother was going to be okay. And did you uh, tell him what was in store for her as far as treatment? Yes. Uh, said she was going to go to UT, uh, but I needed to speak to him about what what happened? Why did why this occur at his his residence? At the UT hospital where yes. she was being transported to. Were you able to talk to him about what had happened? Briefly. Uh, and during my brief conversation, 
he, he then turned his attention towards his mother, and then at some point he just left. Now, you uh, had occasion to see um, some of the angles from the cruiser videos and so forth. Were you able to recognize Mr. Perry from those videos as yes. having entered the scene? Yes. I do not recall him wearing the black jacket. I do recall him wearing the long sleeve gray shirt. And do you recall him from watching those videos being the driver of the, the BMW that appears on those videos? Yes, sir. And getting out of that car? Yes, sir. And going towards the scene or whatever that shows? Yes, sir. And uh, from looking at those videos as well, do you recall seeing him go back to that vehicle and leaving that vehicle. Yes. Now while at the scene, did you also have occasion to talk with uh, uh, Mr. Perry's father, uh, Brandon Oliver. Perry's father? Oliver. Oliver Perry? Yes. Did he show up at some point? He, he showed up, he was, he was at work at the time, he was notified uh, of the shooting, and he came to the house. And uh, after talking with him, did you direct, uh, I guess, Eddie Johnson to take pictures of some other the things out there in yes the, in I, I was directed to a portion of the back fence a wooden fence that had graffiti on, on the side of the fence and, and then also to a sign on the opposite side of the street uh, directly <coughs> from from the house that had other graffiti on it. and who directed you to those locations all over period Now, is that kind of summarize what you did there at that scene initially? What what did you do after talking with those folks and and seeing uh, were you able to kind of get a feel for all the bullets that were fired on scene? It, the gist of everything, yes. Um, for, from there, I, I was given information, and then we, we went went to other locations to, to attempt to find uh, Mr. Perry and other witnesses. And after, who who were you seeking? to talk with after you left that scene? Uh, from there, we, we wanted to talk to Brandon, of course. Uh, there was a Miss Mason, and then a Christopher uh, Bassett, and a Richard Williams I was looking for after that scene. Now, afterwards, when reviewing these cruiser videos that we've talked about, were you able to locate Mr. Bassett being present at that Dallas scene? Yes, the, the, I learned that later on. I did not know he was there at that time. But I did learn that later on watching the videos. You didn't have any contact with him when he was there. Is that no, correct? That is correct. But it, it was that him actually in those videos? Yes, sir. And saying or doing whatever it was he was doing in those videos? Yes, sir. Now, looking for those individuals, were you able to find them or tell us what you did in the search for those individuals that you left Dallas Street looking for? Well, we, we went to some addresses that we had, had addresses for or places we had addresses for. Uh, from there, we tried to make contact with, with them and we were unable to locate them. Okay. So what happened next? Uh, from there, uh, we get another call. And that call is in Mondale. You know about what time you received that call? Uh, sometime after the 10 o'clock hour. The, uh... Finally approach what's been Marcos. Five, six, seven, six. Where witnesses <coughs> and other victims were. Now, were you the only um, uh, violent crimes investigator that went to Lonsdale, or did others go with uh, you? Uh, we, right now, we work in a team of three investigators. It's myself, Investigator Cook, and Investigator Woodlock. Uh, and together we went to, to the Lonsdale team. And when I say together, we drove in separate cars, but we arrived at the same time, basically. And what, did, uh, what, what type of scene were you able to discover? That it was a shooting scene and uh, it was a homicide. And what, based on your initial observations, what led you to that conclusion? Uh, there was a deceased uh, person on the back porch of the residence. Okay. And what what about other bullet damage that you could see initially at that time? Uh, at that time, we, we did see that there were several bullet holes and strikes uh, along the side of the house, and that goes back towards the back to where the back porch was, and made, uh, I was told, or excuse me, where where the victim was, and there was other bullet holes and strikes on the back side of that wall. 
and with crime scene, of course, had been called to uh, uh, document the crime scene and, and gather evidence at that, at that time. Yes, here in Knoxville, we work as a team. I, I'm not responsible for collecting the evidence. Uh, we, we do have crime tech people that come out and photograph, fingerprint, and, and collect that evidence. I do not do that. Now, what were you able to, who were, who were you able to talk to initially uh, to try to find out what had happened? Uh, the homeowner uh, was one of the first people that I, I spoke to. Okay. What about these other kids that later determined to be on that porch? Uh, we, we figured out that these, these young people were on the back porch with our, our victim, uh, basically through their statement saying, I was back there, I, I, I was there. And from there, we, we started separating them and trying to transport them to the police department. And how were they transported to the police department? Some that had family members there that could actually drive, took them, and some of them, some police officers transported. And, and were you able to identify the number of kids that were on the back porch at that time? I, I, I don't know if uh, it was five, six, or something like that at that time. Later on, of course. Okay. But not at that time. Were they all transported at some point to yes, for an inter a formal interview at the police department? Yes, sir. And when did that happen? Uh, directly after the shooting, uh, they, they were tra transported. Uh, I stayed on the scene for some time to learn other things, to see if, if, if there was anything else I could learn before we go to the end of that. About how long did you stay there on the scene, as best you recall? I, I, was to say, I can't tell you if it was an hour or two hours, but it, it was some time. Okay. And did you go then back to the police department to, to conduct those interviews? I did. And um, have, have, did you interview all of them? Were you able to interview all of them at that time? Do you recall? I, I didn't personally interview all of them. Again, we worked as a team. Uh, the, the other two investigators helped me or assisted me in interviewing these people. And were you able to interview all of them? As best you recall. And that's how I recall this. And did at some point also did this Devante Patrick um, come to the police station for an interview as well? Yes. While we were still interviewing the the, the first young set of people, uh, we, we learned about Mr. Patrick. And at that point, uh, with the assistance of other officers, they, they went and got Mr. Patrick. Now while you were conducting those interviews, um, did something else happen? during your attention? Uh, it, it was actually after we had interviewed everybody there uh, at the police department. Uh, we learned about right closely after we were finished there about another shooting that happened in Reno. And, and I forgot, before we leave that, the interviews with <coughs> these uh, kids there at the police department, did they include showing them lineups of, <coughs> of, of folks you might be interested in? <coughs> Yes, sir. And how many different lineups did you prepare to, to show to them? Uh, at that point, we had about three names, uh, and we, we made three different photo, photo lineups, one for each person. And you have copies of those lineups that you made? I do, sir. And can you, you have those handy where you pull them out? Yes, sir. This photo lineup was prepared. This is 
gentleman up in the top, uh, I guess, left-hand corner, I'm not sure what man is, the right-hand corner, uh, would be uh, Mr. Fr uh, Kandarius Griffin. I believe that, that's correct. Griffin or Gilman? Gilman. I'm sorry. Again, uh, I wanted to fix it. I wanted to make sure. Yeah, it was 613 to move in. Out of Jackson, it was 13. No objection. And lastly, you have to do the correct name. It's Kadarius Gilman. And last. Again, this was prepared, and this gentleman right down here in the bottom corner would be Mr. Christopher Bassett. Any of these uh, victims or witnesses there that you were interviewing um, at that time, were they able to select anybody out of the photo lineup no, sir, as having not. been involved in, in what had happened there in Lonsdale? No, sir, they were not. <coughs> Any questions? Any questions? And why did you uh, select those individuals to place into the lineups? Mm -hmm. From what I heard from the first shooting, uh, and then the other gentleman, Mr. Gilmore, was given to me by officers or investigators that thought they, he may be involved. Okay. Now, I believe you were telling us about um, another call that came in while you were conducting those interviews or after you conducted those interviews. After we uh, conducted those interviews, uh, shortly after that, we, we got the shooting and uh, homicide of Mr. Brandon Perry. And where was that? That that was in what we want to call the Green Hills apartment complex off of Natchez Avenue. And did you respond to that location? I did, sir. Again, with your team or by yourself, or did you recover? I, again, with the team. What did you discover when you got there? Well, as I approached the scene, um, it was a large scene. It actually went from the we later learned it went from the top of Green Hills uh, entrance all the way to this apartment uh, building, which I estimate to be 100 plus yards, uh, so, and it encompassed the road and everything else. Um, at that point, we didn't know how large the scene was actually going to be. As I was approaching uh, where the car was impacted into the house or the apartment building, um, as I was walking up, I, I discovered that there was a gentleman upset talking to Austin Adams. And were you able to identify that person? Uh, yes, it's Christopher Bassett that's sitting right over here. Now, were you able to locate, um, well, strike that, were you able to, to understand what had happened to Mr. Perry at that point in time? Did you know? As, I, if you're talking about if it was a shooting, yes, I didn't know it was a shooting, um, and it, it appeared to be a homicide being a shooting did you uh, look around for evidence of a shooting as i was approaching <coughs> the scene the gist of it yes i was looking down there i was not with my flashlight you know doing a canvas or anything like that i or research I, I was just walking looking as i normally do as i enter scene now do you recall when we heard from officer may <coughs> Of course, you told us Mr. Bassett was upset. You recall an attempt by Mr. Bassett to, to get his phone? Um, I, I, he, or he's, battery? Yes. As far as I understood, it was the phone he was looking for. Um, he, he said he, his phone, or I understood his phone was in the car. In which car? And in the car that had impacted into the apartment, the, uh, the BMW. Um, at that point, when he said he was in the car, I had him, you know, take him to the police department. And that's something I'm, I'm going to need to speak with. It, it, as someone that would have information potentially about what had happened? Absolutely. Did you also talk uh, on the scene there with Larry North, who's testified before? Yes, sir. And was he taken also to the police station? Yes, for sir. Did he, yes, go, did he go willingly? Uh, yes, he did.
did tell us what else you did out there at the scene to investigate the particulars of this shooting or this car into the building or whatever was going on out there. Uh, again, uh, went to the scene, started looking around, see what happened. Uh, noticed that that car had been uh, had appeared to be had been struck by several bullets. Um, Mr. Perry had, had been struck at least once. Um, a lot of blood in the car. Um, a lot of damage to the car. From from there, um, speaking to crime lab about what we were going to do to process the scene, how what we were looking at, what we were looking for, and then where the shooting actually occurred. Because of course, it did not appear that the shooting occurred right there where the ha the car struck the house. So of course, we started backing up, looking for shell casings or where that actual shooting occurred. And were you able to locate? Uh as best you could of where the shooting had actually occurred? Again, I, I'm, I, I can't say I located, but I can say our team and when I was at the team, not to the police department, individuals there found shell casings up near the entrance to that little parking area just above where the car left the road into the grassy area and struck down or again the park. And did you have occasion to review uh, video footage from the surveillance cameras there in Green Hill. Yes, sir. It was that there at the time or was that later? No, I, it wasn't there that night. I didn't see that video that night. Uh, I was made aware that Green Hills did have video system or a recording video system there. Okay, so then you what went later to retrieve that video footage? Yes, sir. And we've seen some of it there. The entrance there to, to Green Hills off Natchez, yes. is, that, is that the entrance that that depicts these vehicles coming and going. Yes, sir. Now, is that a uh, through street there at that entrance, or is that a dead end there? Uh, Natchez basically, shortly after the entrance to Green Hills, they dead, dead ends on going eastbound. So, if you, as the video shows, if you're coming in, you're turning left into Green Hills. If you're going out, you've got to turn right. Is that, that that's a fair way to describe it? Yes, unless you want to go to the dead end. Okay. Um, now, the, uh, when did you recall when you had a chance to review the, the video footage from Green Hills? Was that after all the interviews were done? Yes, it was after the interviews were done. Uh, I would say it was a couple days later, actually, just yeah. because of logistics of trying to get the video. Sure. Whenever you get this up before you. Know, yeah, actually, that's, that's perfect fine. time, yes, sir. All right, folks, uh, lunch is here, so uh, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Please not, uh, do not discuss the case for yourselves. Please know what's here. I'll see you after lunch. Thank you, Your Honor. 